Now, we, we can debate, as our coalition does, whether fixing those gas mains is better than switching to electricity. But I think there's a moment coming out of the People's Climate March in Paris where many of us around New York said, we need to work together to have a solution. And that solution has got to include folks from the grassroots who are really doing the work already. It has to include those of us who come out of social justice backgrounds. We don't focus originally on climate change. We focus on getting people good jobs and making sure that they can take care of their families. But if they're not able to breathe right, because they have asthma, if they don't have lights on in the winter or heat, those are real energy issues that have an immediate impact on them. And one of the things that happened at the People's Climate March is that folks who would not traditionally talk to each other also <coughs> And I think that's a real moment that we and many of us at, around this panel and around New York looked around and said, maybe we could have a conversation where labor wasn't saying we want to keep jobs and community wasn't saying we want to shut it down. Because as Anna said, those are the same people right, who need a job and who are trying to keep those jobs in their community. And part of the problem is that both sides have been screwed by the people in power so many times that it's very hard to build that trust. So, we looked, many of us, around New York, and we said, what would a framework for moving forward together look like? And we have since then built this coalition, which has a campaign, which has almost 60 groups. And they go from Buffalo to Long Island, New York City, to up by Albany, the southern tier. And those groups come from every sector, pretty much. Uh, we have labor groups who recognize that their interest is tied with community, and we have community groups that recognize their interest is tied with labor. And what we're trying to do, and I work on the policy side, so that's a big piece of where I see it, but also on organizing, on communications internally, and on trying to think about this vision, figure out how we work together without a fight. Right? And I'll give, I'll give two examples. So we had a conversation the other day, internally, at a meeting about nuclear. Right? And there are lots of answers to be said. Right? But for folks in the coalition, it really comes down to two things. In the long run, we have to get nuclear gone. Right? It's poisonous, it's leaking into our rivers, it's poisoning people. And on the other side, there are 700 good jobs right, in a community that has almost nothing else. Beyond those 700 jobs at Indian Point, right? I'll talk about Indian Point. Indian Point pays about a third of the tax base in that town, which means that on top of those 700 jobs, there are about 1,100 public employees, including most of the teachers who are paid by that money. So it's a real question, right? It's not as simple as close it down tomorrow. Right? We'd love that. If we had control of the state, we could wave a magic wand in Albany and make them do the right thing. Maybe we could do that. But the first step has to be to prove to those workers, right? just like it is to prove to communities on the front line, that we can do this together. And so we focused a lot, and it's been a struggle, on process. Right? We, like the People's Climate March, tried to adopt the MS principles, which I think are great. It is much easier to get somebody a union boss or a politician to look at the MS principles for five seconds and sign on than it is to actually practice that. And so it's been a real struggle and it's a real part of the process to prove that we can do that together. Um, I could go on a long time, but I'm going to try and wrap up pretty quickly. Um, this is a human story that impacts everybody in a lot of ways. And so we have a policy outline that we put together and a lot of people were involved to say, what would it look like to transition New York State to the economy we want? Right? And that means, in a rapid time scale, and we can debate what rapid means, getting rid of fossil fuels. But it also means attaching good job standards, right? Attaching job training and just transition requirements that say that 40 or 50 percent of the money that gets spent and of the people who benefit from the policies that come out have to be in communities like Sunset Park or South Buffalo or uh, Newburgh, New York, right? And those those are kind of basic principles that we got to, and then we developed and are still struggling to finalize a package of legislation, some of which we'll introduce soon this year and some that'll come in next year, that we think does a good job of maintaining that trust and moving us forward. Um, and, and I think that's a real opportunity we're looking at to think about how we bring together a huge coalition. Right? By the time the bill is actually moving, we hope that there are 100 groups around the state. Right? We don't have any youth-led groups. We don't have any elder-led groups with the exception of Uprose, which is intergenerational, very consciously. Uh, and so there's a lot more people in New York who have a lot to benefit and a lot at stake that we're trying to work on. So I'll, drop it, I'll leave it there. We can go on to the national. Um, all right. Can you guys hear me? 
I never really want to get too close to microphones because then I can hear my voice and you have that weird thing where like your voice sounds really weird. Um, my name is Ray Bro. Uh, I work for National People's Action, which is a national network of community organizing organizations who are working on racial and economic justice. Um, and as of late, we've been building out our climate justice work knowing that people of color and low-income communities are on the front lines of the climate crisis and therefore need to be centered in the work for climate justice. Um, I'm a national organizer, so I work with people all across the country and in Canada. Um, and I want to just name, too, that as a national organizer, so in the climate justice world, and Elizabeth touched on this a little bit, but in the movement, um, we use what we call the Jemez Principles which were a set of principles developed in the Jemez Mountains some time ago with the intention uh, to recognize how much space some of the bigger organizations were taking up and how we can get the, the grassroots groups and small local environmental and environmental justice groups um, to actually have that space and that leadership. So I want to recognize too that one of the principles is that communities speak for themselves. And so as a national organizer, I'm obviously sitting here and feeling very privileged and honored to be bringing those stories into the room and to referencing, to be referencing those stories, but definitely want to just reemphasize that those folks are the people that I'm bringing into the room while I talk. Um, and that's actually a lot of my role as a national organizer. Uh, the, I think some folks look at national organizations and they take the road of what Elizabeth was saying, like the helicoptering in. Um, which isn't helpful to anybody. Uh, you sort of get some campaign campaigning goals done, but also at the cost of what real change looks like. Um, and so national organizing is also an opportunity to weave together a lot of the local, statewide, and regional efforts. Um, Frontline-led solutions, the implementation, what change looks like, et cetera. Um, and especially in a climate justice context, um, I don't actually believe in like national big picture climate campaigns because they're a little bit too wonky and not in touch with reality. And if you look at what a national campaign is around climate and you narrow it down into what you're actually moving forward or changing or, or stopping, they're extraction campaigns and they're refinery campaigns and they're export campaigns. And those at their core are campaigns that are taking place in low income communities, communities of color. Those are racial and economic justice campaigns. Um, and then, yeah, uh, in the, tonight we're talking about Paris and a lot of stuff that happened and didn't happen in Paris. Um, I was honored to be in Paris with the It Takes Roots delegation, which was over a hundred leaders and organizers from three different constituencies within Climate Justice, Climate Justice Alliance, the Indigenous Environmental Network, uh, and Grassroots Global Justice. And on one hand, we look at the Paris Agreement, which I don't think anyone really thought was going to be this like, totally legally binding thing that was going to change everything we can wrap up and now climate change is solved. Um, and of course, obviously that didn't happen. We have a pretty watered down agreement that's not legally binding. But what did happen in Paris was we were not invisible. And our constituencies and uh, our delegation was at the front of most marches. Actually, uh, <laughs> in spite of the protest ban in Paris at the time, um, our delegation led what became one of the largest unpermitted marches in Paris, um, from the red line actions to uh, the red lines action that day to the Eiffel Tower, and took over a pretty good chunk of Paris. And it was pretty awesome in that moment to see that, regardless of what we knew was going to happen within the Paris agreements, like we could feel the strength of the movement, and we can see that the people who are on the front lines of the climate crisis are also the ones at the forefront of change. Um, so. I know we'll go into more, so I'll leave it at that. Thank you. Um, one, one of the things that, one of the, the uh, threads that runs through uh, all of these discussions is that the people least responsible for creating climate change are the ones that are going to be most impacted. And um, it is uh, really a tribute to the climate justice movement that they were so visible at the People's Climate March and so visible in, in Paris there wasn't a, a picture that you could that that you'd see that didn't that didn't have the people most impacted front and center, and that's a, that's a tribute to the organizing efforts of all the climate justice activists. Um, I'd like to know if you could share if you could share with with folks who were here today uh, if you could use some examples of what is happening in um, in EJ communities throughout the country. What are communities doing to uh, to reclaim their spaces, to address, to operationalize just transitions. 
what are some of the challenges and what are some of the opportunities that exist right now? In response to that, I'm not sure whether or not we've gone into exactly what is just transitions. So just to make sure we all are on the same page of what that means, it means to transition away from the fossil fuel economy. And it's a demand for a system change. It means taking what we're accustomed to, this day burn dump economy and turning it on its head and doing the exact opposite, but in a just and fair way, in a way that leaves no community behind and does not put the needs of any community over the needs of any other and lifts up the communities that are most vulnerable, most affected by climate change. So now that we have that understanding, I'll go into some of the work that is happening locally on the ground to make sure that we are transitioning in a just way to a clean, green economy and not leaving the most vulnerable communities behind. So I mentioned that the Waterfront Sunset Park is an opportunity to be a leader in the, the green economy, the green energy economy. It doesn't make sense to have solar panels made overseas and then shipped over to the United States. It doesn't make sense for the climate. And it doesn't make sense if we want to maintain a new sort of economy. We want to make sure that in this transition, we have good jobs. Um, also, we see, in the sense of in particular, there's a lot going on. There's a lot of changes happening. We're not immune to the effects of gentrification. It's happening in Sunset Park. And as a result of gentrification, there is talk about garden co-ops bringing clean energy to the community. But it's while that's an excellent goal, we can't have those sort of conversations at the risk of displacing people. It's not fair that the people who have lived there their whole lives exposed to the pollution that comes from the Gowanus Expressway, from the three power plants that are in the community, from the industry that has been along the waterfront for decades to and have had health problems as a result of being exposed to all of these toxins to be pushed out now that we're talking about creating uh, a green economy, creating green jobs and cleaning up the community. It's not fair that we don't get to reap the benefits of that conversation. We have to be the leaders of that conversation. So we also have to be vigilant when it comes to outside developers coming in with ideas and carrying promises of green jobs or opportunity for green energy, who does that serve? And does it displace anyone? So we have to be very wary of these sorts of promises, although they might sound good on, on the surface, who's going to get those jobs? Who's going to get access to that energy? Is it going to be affordable? What about people who live in Section 8 housing? Are we going to, be have, are we going to have access to the energy that's supposedly coming in or being promised by new developers? So that's the sort of an added component to the struggle that we face. On top of fighting for environmental health and environmental justice, we also are fighting to stay in our homes. And displacement and gentrification, where we see that as an environmental injustice because our home is our environment. If we don't have a home, if we're being displaced, that is an injustice, an injustice on our environment. So we've taken on uh, anti-displacement campaign because we have no choice. We see big developers coming in and they're starting to shape and form policy affecting Sunset Park. And it's not fair that these newcomers with a ton of money are able to shape policy that affects us. We have to be at the forefront of policy making and decision making that affects us immediately. Yeah, that's actually being referred to now as green gentrification, where um, a lot of communities, uh, you see it in the South Bronx too, uh, where communities that have basically reclaimed their spaces, have greened them up, have designed greenways, uh, have put in trees, are now being displaced and, and developers are using those successes, those environmental amenities, to displace those communities. Um, in Sunset Park, for example, um, and it's kind of unfair because I'm um, the executive director of Upfront, so I always have to add something more. 
Um, the industrial waterfront actually prevents us, protects us from displacement. But what's happening with the industrial waterfront is that it's being commercialized and they're shrinking the industrial sector. And the industrial sector itself can be the vehicle for addressing climate adaptation and resilience. It could actually be a new form of, in, of, of, manu of manufacturing and industrial use uh, that would address New York City's local and regional needs. And that's being neglected because it's a market-driven agenda that is being supported by the city. Um, so those are some of the challenges that are faced locally. At the state level, uh, Stefan, uh, I know that it bringing unions together, and unions have actually been working with us now for a few years, that's a new thing, to see uh, unions working side by side with the environmental justice movement is a really powerful thing. But they're faced with challenges because they are either in the coal economy or an upstate where they are working for a nuclear power plant. Uh, what do you tell them about bringing them into New York Renews and how do you bring them along um, if their jobs can be lost as a result of what we're proposing to do? Yeah. Uh, to is that what's happening? Okay. Sorry. So I mean, I think there are a lot of different pieces to that. It's a really important question and it's one we're struggling with. Uh, one piece is, as you know, the coordinators, all of us who are working on putting together New York Renews, uh, to make sure that there are both frontline communities and unions in leadership. Right? That we're not putting together the policy outline or talking about how we're moving forward publicly without making sure that we actually are including leaders and the vision that serves that community. And that can be difficult, right? We're, we're also, I think, very conscious as a coalition that everybody has a lot of stuff going on. Right? And that impacts capacity to do the work on your news. But it also means that we have to start living and walking the walk now, right? That we, for example, at Working Families and a lot of the groups have to say to unions that are looking at job losses because of coal plant closure, yeah, we consider that a victory. But if the state doesn't make sure that those 70 workers, 150 <coughs> workers are taken care of, then even though we're environmental groups or we're social justice groups or we're not solely focused on Dunkirk, right? We're going to stand with you and make sure that that actually gets taken into the fight. Right? And that that's hard, right? And those are slow processes, and building trust is slow. And it's been the work we're doing now is built on years of work to build that trust, both in New York with communities downstate and upstate. And I think we're starting to see some real signs that folks are reaching out rather than sitting back to be talked to. Right? Uh, the electrical workers want, are worried that offshore wind would take away jobs because they've replaced polluting natural gas beakers. But instead of digging their heels in, they looked at what was going on with upstate on coal plants, the debate with community members around nuclear power, and a whole host of other issues, and said, let's sit down and figure out, right? Could we support setting up a huge offshore wind industry that in the long run would be way better for our workers, right? It would be less polluting for our communities, it would be good, long-term, sustainable jobs, right? Renewable energy even employs more people than fossil fuels. But we have to start that conversation and continually build it. Right? In the same way we have to, those of us who are from national and statewide groups that don't have a really good local track record, have to be humble and recognize that every time we're starting to work with a new group, whether it's Uprose or a community group in Rhode Island or in Buffalo, that we're suspect for good reason. Stefan, do you think that uh, this economy, the one that we're living in right now, uh, is going to sustain the planet and the people? Or, or, is, or are we proposing something so radically different that that in itself presents the challenge? I mean, I think that's certainly the challenge in a coalition like this, is that there are people, even who support climate change, right? let's just be real, there are probably people in this room who think climate change is the most important thing, and the thing we need to do is resolve climate change. And there are some of us in the room who say, if I starve to death or I can't afford my electric bill because of that transition, that's not a win. Right? And that's a real thing. right? People really do not survive because the policies around energy are there. And so I think you know, for us, we have to have a vision of a dramatically different uh, community and energy system and economy, for me, that challenges sort of the root of capitalism as we practice it now. Uh, that's not the position of New York Renews, right? If you try and envision getting the Sierra Club to sign on to anti-capitalism or 
getting the International Brotherhood Electrical Workers to say, we're done tomorrow, no more fossil fuels? It's not going to happen. And so there's a real challenge there. But I think for many of us, um, you know, the, the excitement of this project is to get to sit down with folks who actually do believe that's the case. And, and our job becomes to bring along the folks who don't think that. How many people in this room think that climate change is the most important thing uh, right now? One, two, what? What? It's okay, we'll have a good discussion. What? Are you tired? Is it hot in here? <laughs> Um, so, um, you know, we, we went to Paris, and we went having spent an enormous amount of time building relationships. We went trusting um, that that um, work that was done in terms of building just relationships would survive. Uh, we went on this idea that we weren't supporting the dig, burn, and dump economy, that we were all on the same page, and then something happens in Paris. What happens in Paris where there was a disconnect, I think, between the climate justice movement and those folks who pretend to speak for us? What, what happened there? And, 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 and when you talk about it, it would be interesting to share for, for folks who are here why that presents a problem in terms of moving um, uh, a climate justice agenda nationally in this country. What, what is the challenge that that kind of disconnect uh, presents for us locally? Um, I like when Anna started this panel by saying, really though, what the fuck happened in Paris? Um, <laughs> I mean, guys, you guys can tweet that. <laughs> okay. That's actually a hashtag from Paris, what the fuck happened in Paris. Um, I mean, what happens anytime we have big green groups and, and environmental justice and climate justice groups working together on something? Um, this is why things like the Hemis Principles were formed, like we talked about earlier, and why the B Initiative was formed, to like talk about what a relationship looks like in just and equitable ways. And the reality is building that is really hard. Um, <laughs> it's really hard and you don't always know the answer, and you also, it takes a lot of humility in the ability to be wrong a lot, to learn from your own mistakes. And I think that's actually a lot of what we saw in Paris, was people more or less hopefully more, learning from their mistakes. Um, but what happens is when we're not actually aligned with each other, we're not, we're not getting things, we're not moving forward. Um, and a lot of times big national organizations, who uh, someone, so like the grass tops and like big national groups are like, in order to win this campaign, we need to do X, Y, and Z, and then we're good and we're done. And then often the climate justice and environmental justice groups are like, well, if you win that, like your campaign goal may further, but it's not actually changing the ways that we work in these systems. Our people are still affected. We're still the ones that are bearing the brunt of the outcome. And another problem is just going to happen like this one again because we're not actually changing the systems that are driving these problems. Um, so in terms of like moving a national climate justice agenda and even a global climate justice agenda, it's really tricky when people are like, we have the answers, we're going to move this forward. We have this campaign plan, we're going to get 1.5 degrees, we're good to go. But what do you, like, how do we get 1.5 degrees if we don't actually weave together the local leadership? How do we get to 1.5 degrees if we don't actually put the power in the communities who are dealing with the brunts of climate change from both sides? So they're dealing with the extraction and the water pollution and the air pollution and losing land and all this other stuff from, from climate and also on the front lines of the storms and the droughts and the wildfires. Um, and are the ones that are already transitioning their communities around survival strategies. Like, there's obviously a lot of weight in the strategies that these communities have. That's why we still exist. There's a lot of, uh, in Paris, a lot of the we're still here narrative was saying, we've gone, like,